All right, great. Um, thank you. Thank you for coming out. Uh, off the top, Portage Place is located on lands uh, stolen from the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland and heartland of the Red River Métis Nation. Uh, we're on the, the land of the people of Treaty 1. We drink the waters of Shoal Lake, uh, and we use hydroelectric power originating from the waters of Treaty 5. We're all treaty people, and as such, uh, commit to engaging with, questioning, and critiquing the structures and practices that perpetuate the status quo as it pertains to indigenous people in Manitoba. My name is uh, Cam Scott. I won't take up so much of your time. I'm here on behalf of West Broadway Tenants Committee, and our role in this organizing has been one uh, chiefly of relay of long-standing and, uh, and more recent community demands and organizing from uh, a number of nonprofits and grassroots movements and downtown residents. Um, there is a press release here that I'll just uh, vocalize a little bit and give you a sense of the speaking order. The, the health and vibrancy of Winnipeg's downtown depends on a, on a bold community-driven vision for Portage Place, but uh, decades of failed development have ignored the voices and demands of the many communities that use and depend on Portage Place. So in September 2021, Starlight Investments backed away from a plan to redevelop Portage Place as unaffordable housing, bluntly, demanding millions of dollars from several levels of uh, government for a for-profit proposal that doesn't benefit the people who are already here and use Portage Place. And in the aftermath of organizing around Starlight, uh, we started putting together uh, community visioning sessions. Uh, the office of Winnipeg Center Member of Parliament Leah Gazan organized a telephone town hall with over 1,600 downtown participants and voices. And what has come from this research following on the State of the Inner City report is what we're launching today, a community vision for the future of Portage Place. It's based on four pillars iterated by Owen Taves in the State of the Inner City report, that Portage Place should be a nonprofit community center, that it should include new rent geared to income social housing units, it should have a real safety plan that centers indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit people replacing the current security approach. And uh, finally, uh, indigenous people should own Portage Place. And these community demands, they're not new. They're not new, and it's, uh, it's an honor to present them here all in one place. We're coming up on a municipal election. I'm just going to read a couple of statements from Leah Gazan, Member of Parliament for Winnipeg Centre can't be here today. This grassroots report is a powerful document that outlines what a people-centered future for Portage Place looks like. I'm proud to support it and I hope that we can realize its vision for a Portage Place that keeps community at its center. That's from Leah. Cindy Gilroy, who is the city councillor for Daniel McIntyre, uh, sends this. As the city councillor for the ward in which Portage Place is located, I'm committed to preserving this space as a community asset for residents who live near the mall and for other citizens who enjoy coming downtown. In the spirit of reconciliation, the city was able to work with Southern Chief's organization to give new life to the Hudson's Bay Building, and I see this as an example of what we could do with Portage Place, a community space that includes affordable housing where Indigenous and newcomer voices are heard, and one that makes the community the center of all further developments. So that's a bit of an idea of what you'll see here in the community vision for the future of Portage Place. We have some to distribute today as well as a press release. Um, without further ado, I would like to introduce our speakers. First, uh, Josh Brandon from the Social Planning Council of Winnipeg. Thanks so much, Cam, and, uh, and thank you to the organizers of this event. I applaud the excellent work that has been done to articulate community priorities. Uh, the, the document is, is quite clear. Portage Place has a vital role in our community. We're at the heart of downtown Winnipeg, and if Winnipeg is to be a successful community, this location needs to reflect the needs and priorities of the people who live here and in the surrounding areas. And uh, 
I just wanted to highlight a couple of things about our history in the project. The Social Planning Council of Winnipeg, back in 2019, when it first became apparent that uh, this location, that the Portage Place was potentially up for sale to a, to a Toronto developer, we brought together a coalition of community voices to help inform the project because we felt that if the private sector and government can listen to the community, then we can build a more successful project for everyone. Unfortunately, those priorities did not end up being reflected in, uh, in the proposal that was going forward. Uh, the developer ended up pulling out of the project. But we hope that now going forward, that if governments had tens of millions of dollars to invest in this project with a private developer at the spearhead of it, it should have equal resources to, uh, to promote development community-led development here in Winnipeg. Uh, in fact, when we were doing that process of consultation, we discovered that Winnipeg is potentially leaving up to $30 million on the table from federal money because of the way the project was structured without community voices at the table. Uh, the national housing strategy, the federal housing strategy, does give priority to those kinds of projects and we need to make the best possible use of, of the funds that are available. The other thing that I want to highlight about the funding aspect is that currently $3 million a year comes out of Portage Place to help subsidize the forks. And if this project is going to be successful, that parking revenue and all the revenue that is invested in this part of downtown uh, needs to stay downtown. The Forks, it's a great location. I went there with my family last weekend. It's a thriving tourist uh, hotspot, but this part of the city north of Portage also needs those resources. And so that, uh, that's a, a financial aspect that we need to consider in our redevelopment. So just to conclude, we're 33 days out from a municipal election right now, and we need to see uh, the priorities that have been clearly identified by the community reflected in all of the people's campaigns who are running for mayor and council, and we look forward to, uh, to those being enacted uh, by the next municipal government. So congratulations and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Um, next, uh, I'll, I'll call up uh, Andre Forrest from the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. Uh, thank you, Cam. <clears throat> Tanche, my name is Andre Forrest, uh, project coordinator at the Manitoba Research Alliance at the Canadian uh, Centre for Policy Alternatives. So as been mentioned uh, earlier this year, we published the annual State of the Inner City Report. Um, with one chapter centering on Portage Place and the folks working hard to make it a place of community rather than commodity. Owen Taves' chapter, What's Going On with Portage Place, outlined the work of grassroots organizations, um, community members in fighting against the sale of the mall to Starlight. The research echoed um, the historical record and what we've heard here already that this place was built on the premise of solving a number of community issues that existed at the time and so with the 35th anniversary of the mall this means 40 years ago some of these same calls were made the need for housing for daycare for social supports um, and this again over 35 years ago the mall uh, did not deliver those needs are still very present perhaps even more so um, and while the mall has uh, perhaps largely failed as a place of commerce, it has absolutely not failed in its presence um, as a central place of gathering for people downtown. Um, and think of the Idle No More round dance that was held here as a perfect <coughs> representation of, of uh, its being a space uh, for community to gather. Um, in January, to support the launch of the research, we filmed a segment actually right here in this space um, with a number of folks who had close ties to the, the mall, um, including Renata Mikans, who was also interviewed as part of uh, Owen Taves' research. Uh, Renata is the daughter of the late Ogichida of Portage Place, uh, Joe Mikans, who um, a lot of people called the chief of Portage Place. He had uh, casual meetings here. People knew that he uh, was here to support folks in the community, and it was kind of a, an unofficial office where he supported lots. And 
Um, you can see uh, news articles about kind of his story here. Um, Renata spoke about the potential of this place, uh, really the opportunity that exists in making this place a hub for art, um, for youth, um, and also recognizing the historical contributions of First Nations here and how uh, many folks found themselves here after uh, histories of displacement. Um, and we've seen a hint of what that could look like uh, with the Bay Development Promise across the street. How can it return um, and really meet the needs of the community? Um, so anything that happens here in this place must keep community at its heart. Um, the visioning document really speaks to that. You've heard it from the voices of those uh, here, of those who worked to, to kind of fight for that vision 40 years ago. Um, we heard it in the research. Um, it's been confirmed again by the priorities. All the community organizations in the area are working on the same things and this place could be uh, the, the home for that. Um, so all election hopefuls should really echo the calls made um, and uh, hope to see um, folks uh, really kind of take this community vision at heart and uh, fight for the Portage Place that, um, that should be. Merci for having me. Um, next is Ruben Garang from Immigration Partnership Winnipeg. Morning. <clears throat> I'm Ruben Garang, the Director of Immigration Partnership in Winnipeg. Thank to West uh, Broadway Tenant Committee and other organizations that are involved in this uh, visioning of the downtown mall. <clears throat> Let me say briefly that uh, Immigration Partnership Winnipeg exists to uh, make Winnipeg a welcome and inclusive multicultural city where newcomers who left their countries of origin for many reasons and have chosen Winnipeg as their new home be supported and welcome. We do this important work through engaging with stakeholders from different levels of the government, indigenous peoples, newcomer settlement sector, business community, ethnocultural communities, and others. We know, and it's been reported uh, in Statics, Statistic Canada, report of 2017, that 23.9% of the Winnipegers are of immigrant background. And we know recently that we are every year, and most recently, receiving newcomers from different parts of the world. From April to August this year alone, we received over 4,000 um, Ukrainians who arrived in our city, and most of them remain here in Winnipeg. We also received newcomers from Afghans and other parts of the world. The point I wanted to make is that downtown is home for many newcomers, most of whom came from collective societies where meeting places is always a center of their life. Therefore, the mall here is a meeting place for many newcomers, as well as indigenous people and others. If it has to be redeveloped. The need of these communities in the surrounding of the mall have to be factored into the redevelopment process and planning. From the, from the newcomer's standpoint, we hope to see one-stop shopping sites, a place for ethnocultural communities and indigenous people and Winnipegers to learn different cultures, a place for sharing arts, like we are here today, a place for sharing ethnic foods, and a place with accessible and affordable housing units to meet needs of various family size. All this, if are done or considered will be the way to celebrate 
the diversity of our city. So I conclude by calling upon Winnipeg's particularly leaders and developers who might be involved in envisioning the redevelopment of the mall to incorporate community voices <coughs> into the planning. <coughs> it will benefit, it will be a benefit for all of us if we reflect our diversity in all aspects of our life. So we can grow together and build a prosperous city. It costs us so dearly if we alleviate and neglect part of our city population. In this process, it has to be inclusive and it has to be reflective of the people that live around here. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ruben. That concludes the speaker's list. Fearless R2W sends uh, support for the document but are unable to be here today. Uh, that is one of many organizations who participated in the process of assembling these demands. Uh, you can see the signatories on the draft document that is distributed, as well as the present and historic demands collated here. Uh, to conclude, and before there are any questions, I just want to say that we hear again and again that Portage Place uh, is, is vacant and the downtown is empty and all of these plans for development are purposed at bringing people downtown and this is flatly untrue. There are many, many people who use and depend upon Portage Place as a vital resource already and that is the cause for this organizing and the cause for these uh, important demands. So, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if anyone has any questions for the with the speakers or mm -hmm. myself? Maybe I, I'm guessing maybe you can answer this, but so have you had any feedback from any of the um, candidates running? Have you talked to any of them? Has there been any sort of like back and forth between them right now? Do you know um, what I'll say? And I, I, don't, uh, I don't mean to make this a challenge so forthrightly is there's been very little engagement and very little vision for Portage Place for many of the candidates so far. But uh, we see this as an opportunity. The election is on October 26th, and there are uh, plenty of opportunities in the month ahead for deep discussion about different visions for Portage Place. Having seen the Starlight Vision fail, which is, I think, a notably disastrous one, uh, what the purpose of this document is, is to, is to hopefully hold candidates accountable to what people who, who live downtown have been asking a long time. Um, what if you, uh, if, you know, you want to synopsize, obviously there's a lot in the report, right? If you can synopsize in a few sentences what you would say to maybe some of those candidates, like to, you know, just, like I say, synopsize. Yeah, absolutely. I think that the really, really important things as I say, this is based on these four pillars of people-centered development is, is the language of the report. And it reduces to several key recurrent demands. Uh, that is rent geared to income, so truly affordable housing downtown. Um, free and non-profit gathering space, because Portage Place is already a gathering space for so many and uh, should be acknowledged as such and funded as such. Um, a, a real community safety plan that is resource-based rather than uh, simply a security presence and, uh, and, and, and real indigenous ownership. I think multiple speakers today have mentioned the, the great development with South, Southern Chiefs Organization and the, the Hudson Bay Company building. So this is already underway downtown that it can be a site of uh, indigenous leadership and reconciliation. I mean, it's going to take more than just the, if we can sort of expand on that, it's going to take more than just the civic level of uh, Absolutely. participation. Have you had any communications with the provincial government, uh, you know, federal as well? Yeah, um, you know, we've had support from um, individuals, as I said, uh, you know, Cindy Gilroy at the city level and Leah Gazan federally. Uh, there has been some discussion of this. Uh, on that point, I would strongly echo and perhaps other people than myself can answer questions. Uh, 
Josh's call that all three levels of government should uh, participate in this as fulsomely as they were willing to participate in the Starlight proposal. Are there any questions for any other uh, speakers or? Yeah, yeah. If does, does, does anybody else say wants to add anything? It's an it's an open mic. Would anyone else like to contribute to these? Just state your name again, sorry. Sure. Uh, Andre Forest with the Manitoba Research Alliance and Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives. Um, to me, this also feels like an opportunity to put, uh, to put, uh, this place? maybe we'll just pause for a second. Yeah. <laughs> it looks like there's a block in there. I can't look at anything. Um, is that all right to start over? All right. Um, I'm Andre from the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. Um, and to me, this place represents, and the opportunity that this is, is to put into practice what people are talking about. All levels want to see a resolution in the uh, homelessness and affordability crisis. People want to act on reconciliation. People are, t you know, all levels of government are talking about that. And it feels like an opportunity to do just that. Well, you know what, since the Scarlet uh, Project, whatever you want to call it, was, you know, wasn't able to uh, sort of follow through on the potential there, there's been, it's just sort of like kind of a lot of dead, dead air. Yep. Dead. So I guess the hope is that we can just find something for this space because there, there is a lot of potential there. Right? Exactly, and I think that that potential and and losing the opportunity, right? If levels of government that are sitting at the table at the Forks North Portage um, governance table let the opportunity go, it's a huge huge missed opportunity, and it uh, it's um, kind of this challenge is, is to ask them to come to the table and figure something out, and not just let it be at the whim of the private sector as the Starlight de development was. That's one thing I didn't ask the West End um, gentlemen, but like. It has portage, it has portage, the, I guess the what, forks now, portage yep. right there. Have they said anything? Is there anything that you can... Have we heard anything from them, or are they just kind of mum on it? Uh, I think they're currently still in the process of finding a board chair, which which might help set the direction for some of the conversations, but uh, I couldn't speak to that. Yes, um, of course. You don't have an answer. The only thing that I wanted to highlight is the aspect of safety. Uh, when people talk about safety, it has to be um, talked about uh, in a sense to meet the need of the people here, not the, meet the need of the business community. Uh, I, I, I walk around here uh, closer to the malls and sometimes I come here and, 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 and sometimes the way people are treated and it's not respectful. And we know that there are people with a number of challenges for different reasons that uh, all of us as in the city need to work together to you know, address those challenges. And so when people talk about safety, it shouldn't be uh, safety to make sure that you know, the business thrives and the community is excluded. It is very important to respect people. It is very important to understand the needs of the people and the challenges that they are going through. And that would be a respectful place if we consider those. I think we've learned over the years, I don't know if you can speak on this, is that if you don't have the people to come downtown, or the people who live or are in the community, the downtown community, the businesses and the, like those types of things um, are, are harder to do, right? You know, the, the businesses aren't going to necessarily be as successful, potentially, right? If there's not the people here. So it's difficult. It's sort of like a, the, you know, one, right? You can't have one with the Wickens first. You have to have the people down here to. And I think that's, that's, that's why it is very important to engage with the community because when we say people, what, what do we mean by people? You know, uh, you know it's says people that, that are here, um, newcomers, indigenous people, low-income families, they are also people. And so, and that's what, that, this is our point, that uh, redeveloping this place, they have to be the center of it. Uh, we know that if it is, if if they are if their needs are incorporated, others could still come. This place will still be a place for everybody. Like has been mentioned earlier, that this place is already being used by all people. We just don't want it that uh, idea or, you know, the thinking that it has to be developed 
for the business community and ignoring the needs of the people that live here. We know that people live here have some challenges, but those are also our responsibility, and that's why we need they need to be incorporated into the planning. And, and talking about newcomers and lower income families, working with them, how much of a challenge is it to find that affordable housing right now? Well, it's very difficult. It's not easy. Uh, in, it's, it's, it's difficult in a number of ways. Uh, we know that uh, I, we have seen some families that come with light family size, for example. They don't find places. Sometimes they have to be split, you know, where you know, some family members will stay in one apartment and others will go to another, which is not good uh, for people that are navigating different cultures and different new, uh, you know, and, and, and trying to settle in a, in a new place. They need that sense of family unit to be around. And so there, there, there are some, there, there are a number of, uh, re, you know, um, needs within those communities. Affordability is one thing, you know, because if they are new, you know, they don't. Uh, some of them might not have jobs, and so that's also a challenge for them to rent, find a, a, a you know, a place that they can rent for their families. Yeah, especially downtown, right? Yep. Yeah. Mostly yeah. condos. Um, thank you. Maybe this is a question for anyone. There has been safety concerns from business owners in downtown. There has been safety concerns from, um, you know, residents who have lived here for a long time. I'm wondering what would your recommendations be in terms of addressing those tensions to the community of those who are downtown? We, 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 we talked about this last time, and we, we actually suggested that um, if there is a concern, there is a, 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 a backland type of uh, community widows that could, uh, you know, uh, be employed here, and these are people that look after the needs of the people. And so, if in, if, if if there are concern from the business community, that would also like be one of the best way to address those one. I think if we work collectively as a community, there won't be no a problem. But if we assume too much and then build into our policy making that assumption. That's where we fail to solve issues. So potentially looking at employment options for, well, I think I should be more clear, like there's been tensions with those who are homeless in downtown yeah. and the business community. So I, but from what I'm hearing, I just want to make sure I'm hearing you correctly, is that um, you're recommending employment solutions for those who actually have businesses downtown. Is that correct? You're not, so maybe I misunderstood what you were saying. Sorry, so yeah. yeah, I thought you were talking about the, the safety concern for the for the business community, and that's why I say that there could be other ways to address that, and there are already ways to address that in the community. But yeah, I would allow some of my colleagues to answer that question. Thanks for your thanks for your great job. Yeah. yeah, I think I think what Ruben says is is absolutely right. That we're not going to solve all of the safety concerns of the city of Winnipeg and of downtown Winnipeg with a focus on more policing. We need more community development and, and many of the solutions that are outlined in the report talking about creating more community spaces. Uh, we need to focus on uh, spaces where uh, where p community can gather, community can heal. Uh, a lot of people in the community have talked about the need for safe injection sites or safe consumption sites, uh, more community health, and uh, basically all of the uh, all of the pieces of the puzzle fit together. You can't just solve the solution the the problems of uh, downtown safety with more policing we need to have community-led solutions and portage place can be a part of that i think maybe andre has a few things to add to that um yeah just to add that uh, meeting people's needs creates safety right communities are safer when everybody's needs are met so focusing on that is a way to create safety and i think um, i'd hope to um, speak to RTW because they had an amazing program uh, 
they hired for last summer was a community safety host program. So it was at, I think, the Millennium Library and maybe one other library where they uh, hired Indigenous folks to um, know the full gamut of services that are available to people who are struggling or anybody who needs support and have um, the, the, you know, tr train them in order to be uh, hosts in the community that can provide um, both safety um, kind of in two directions, right? Help people who are in need and also act as kind of a, um, you know, a community person in uh, help helping others. So I think that program would be one to look to as a successful model of what community-led safety looks like. Was that just sort of like they knew the knowledge and if they saw somebody or was that an actual sort of patrol, like you know what I mean? Was that a more organized patrol? Um, I, I, yeah. I think it's those questions for RT, no, I think they, yeah. they were stationed at, um, replaced kind of the security that would have been at the library, okay. and rather than uh, focus more on security, they, they were supporting those who, uh, who were there with the resources available. Yeah. Um, I just also have a question about the uh, rent gear to income social housing. I'm wondering if you folks have looked at an example um, in your mind that works really well for this type of development, and if you could kind of point us to that in terms of that's the type of uh, example that you're looking for in terms of social housing. Has, has, has there been a, somewhere that has done that that you think has done really well and you want to point us to? Or? Um, no, no, I think you're probably bad, best oh, okay. place yeah. to answer that one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think what we need is a lot more social housing and very often uh, when when governments or, or development plans uh, get put in place the idea is that one project is going to solve this we have thousands of people here in Winnipeg on the waiting list for social housing and you know whether it's a few hundred spaces here or even a, a thousand spaces here at, at Portage Place that would be created, that's not going to solve all of the housing concerns. We need a long-term plan for creating affordable housing that's truly affordable to low-income people. So that's rent geared to income or very deeply subsidized housing. Now there's a number of projects that have been created over the past several years. Uh, there was a period of time from approximately 2010 to 2015 where the province of Manitoba was building 300 units of housing, uh, low-income housing per year and uh, that stopped the last several years and there's only been a trickle of development since then. So we need to get back to that large-scale development of, uh, of subsidizing more and more units. The plan that was put forward here at Portage Place would have created a small number of those units, but 70% of the, of the units that were proposed under Starlight's development plan would have actually been luxury housing, uh, housing costing more than $1,500 per month, which is unaffordable to many uh, middle-income Winnipeggers, let alone to the people who are struggling and in dire need of housing. So do you mind just saying yeah. your name? And, uh, sure, yeah, my name's uh, Josh Brandon. I'm with the Social Planning Council of Winnipeg. I think we have it earlier, I just want to make sure. Thanks. Are there any other questions for any participants? Or? Okay. Yeah, thank you so, so much for coming. And uh, do take, there's a, there's a press release here, as well as uh, the community vision, which can also be accessed on a website that is at the bottom of the press release. Let me fumble with the pages. Uh, it's portageplacecommunityvision.com. Yeah, thank you so, so much.